The decision to bring Michael Myers back to the Halloween series was made by the executive producer, Mustafa Arkad. And I think he felt that part three had strayed a bit from what made the Halloween series the, the, the sort of the gem that it was. And they tried something experimental, which had its own value. But in retrospect, I think they felt Michael Myers really was the Halloween series and they needed a way to bring him back. There was kind of an impasse on how to move forward. And uh, there was a couple potential treatments and takes on it. And it just was sort of dead in the water. And there wasn't that much appetite to do another one after Season of the Witch. There was an earlier treatment that uh, I believe John and, and Deborah were working on. There was some discussion and there was sort of an impasse on how to move forward with it. You know, because of the success of the first one, we always, every one we do, we always go back, we like to go back to the first one. I mean, that's because that's the success. We did two, it was a, quite a success. And then number three, we had an argument, let's change a little bit. I mean, at the time, the sequels was not even, there was no sequels. I mean, we started kind of a sequels on this. So number three, they said, well, let's change, let's not uh, change the story. And we did number three without Michael Myers. And it was not as successful. So on four, I took it over and went back to the basics of number one. And I'd been working with my writing partner, Alan McElroy, on another project. And he was a fan, but also a great, great genre writer. The scripts they had didn't work and they were running out of time because it was a writer's strike coming. And he came to me and said, you know, would I look at this project? Could I come on board and take a look at it? And we sat down and put a pitch together that we thought would make Mustafa happy and solve his problems, but also create a really a suspense thriller that we wanted to make. So I went in and pitched our own story and they really sort of leapt at it. And we had 11 days to do, to do the script. So, uh, you know, I sort of jumped in with both feet and just uh, ran with it. I mean, and I loved it because Halloween 2 had been one of the, the great experiences for me when I was in college, going to see that with friends. So the chance to bring the shape back to life was a dream come true for me. We engaged Paul Freeman to produce. And Paul Freeman is a, is a great producer, but most of his experience has been, for the most part, in TV. Uh, and the upside of that, the good side of that, is he just ran a really tight, well-oiled machine. Moving to Utah was all on me. I had shot a couple of movies there, and I knew that there was a good acting pool and a good uh, shooting crew. And it could be done as cheap, not as cheap, cheaper than doing it in LA. The effort to recreate Haddonfield and Salt Lake City was not problematic for me because I thought it was a perfect look. The town of Haddonfield was really the character that, that Alan and I felt so committed to. John Carpenter found it in Pasadena. We found our version in Salt Lake City, but everything that I wanted, the, the cornfields, the, the barns, the houses, the suburban streets, the school, everything was there. We just had to avoid the mountains. My original script uh, for Halloween 4, the opening scene was a shot down the hospital corridor looking at a wall. And it was sort of a beat and a beat, and then the, the explosion, the wall would just would burst open from that blast, and you would see Dr. Loomis's body flying backwards, you know, kind of in, you know, a flame, and you know, almost right directly at the camera, and then you would cut, so you would know he was blasted out of that room and survived. We decided only to reference the first movie, and I think the reason was that we didn't want to get um, sort of tied up with a lot of logic police questions about Michael and exactly what happened to Dr. Loomis, what exactly what happened at the end of the hospital. I mean, Alan studied it very carefully, so we knew that if we were going to hit any landmines or make any big mistakes, but I didn't really want to be influenced artistically by anything other than Halloween 1, which I thought I, that's what I was really trying to recapture was the spirit of that first movie. I still wish that we'd gone back and done that shot because I think it would have been a great tie-in uh, to the continuity of the, of the first film. And I, I wish we had, we had done that because I just visually I think it would have been a stunning, stunning opening for the movie. We didn't feel it was critical to have the Myers house because we had the penitentiary, the criminal insane asylum where Michael had been for 10 years. 
And that was his house. In our, in our movie, that was where Michael lived, and that's where he was. So we needed to effectively break him out of that asylum and set him loose on Haddonfield. And that took some careful plotting and some careful thinking to see, you know, how, how do you free Michael Myers? And, of course, the prison transfer idea was what became the vehicle, the engine, to get Michael out. Yeah, this is where society dumps its worst nightmares. Every movie in the history of the world has got their exposition scene because you've got to get that out of the way. You know, you've got to let the audience get oriented. And when we went down the elevator in the criminal asylum, um, we got it all done in one elevator ride. It's, it's better to just get it out of the way. It's been 10 years. He's been locked up. He murdered 16 people, maybe more, trying to get to his sister. Nearly got it, too. But his doctor, of all people, shot him six times. Then he set him on fire. Both of them nearly burned to death. It's a setup of the entire movie. It's, it's very dark and it's raining and it's this, that, and the other thing. And he said, and uh, he basically said, well, I want this guy to be really, like, edgy. You know what I mean? Almost like, well, is he an inmate or isn't he an inmate? Welcome to hell. We had a sequence where the guard in the criminal sane asylum takes our personnel down through a hallway where there are other inmates, serial killers, people from the criminally insane. They were pretty good sequences and they were nice details, but for the sake of the overall pace of the movie, it was just too much time setting up story and we needed to get going. So we just kind of pulled those shots out and, and got right down to Michael. God bless Mr. and Mrs. Carruthers. God bless Rachel. God bless Sunday. God bless me. God bless Mommy and Daddy in heaven. Amen. We went all the way to New York City to find Danielle Harris. I literally just went on an audition and walked in and, and read for casting, and I think I had to cry in a scene. It was like, scream for me, cry for me, and uh, read the scenes. And when she came in, she just captivated the room. She was young, but also very precocious. She was very poised, she was very mature. And we felt that with all the things that we were gonna be asking of this young actor, that she was gonna be able to handle it without being in any way adversely affected by it. And she just had the confidence as a, as a kid to do it. I was so excited to be making a movie because it was my first movie and they treated me like I was a little adult. I mean, I, there really was no like, oh, she's a kid, you need to you know, treat her like a kid. I mean, even the stuff that we did, like the stunts and just sort of the emotional stuff, I was very much a little 40-year-old trapped in this like little shrimp of a body. But I only had, was only allowed to see the first one, so I hadn't seen any of the other ones till I actually got much older. We really made sure that she was cared for and, and knew what she was doing, but at the same time, you know, wasn't exposed to a lot of violence or anything like that. Everybody on set, actually all the special effects guys, like we would be in the trailer and they would be showing me how things were done. And so I think they wanted to make sure that I, I wasn't too uh, traumatized as, as a child to the best that they possibly could. And it didn't really bother me. It's Halloween. I mean, don't you want to get dressed up in a really scary costume and get some candy? The interesting thing with Ellie Cornell was that we were down to the last two or three girls uh, who we thought could play that part. And there was some disagreement between myself and uh, Mustafa and the Galaxy camp and, my, and Alan. And we, were, we had different points of view about how, which way we should go. And um, so what I finally persuaded Mustafa to do is, is do a proper screen test. Yeah, and in those days, we did it on film in 35 millimeter, and then we projected those dailies in a theater. I loved the script, and I loved the character of Rachel Carruthers. She was smart, and she stuck to her guns, and she was a fighter. Ellie was very real, and I felt that she came from Haddonfield, and I felt like she represented a kind of um, wholesome quality that was going to get our empathy and our sympathy as the movie went along. And a lot of um, 80s, you know, sort of screen movies would have very, very glamorous leads. And I, and I, I never felt it was quite real to the, to the town that they were from. And when we projected the film in the theater, then Mustafa sort of understood my point of view. 
Danielle and I spent most of the shoot together, day or night. I mean, honestly, her and her mom and I hung out a lot together. So we had the closest relationship for sure. Wise up to what men want, Rachel. Or Brady won't be the last man you lose to another woman. Everyone thinks we've got this long running feud or something, but it's pretty funny. We don't, she's a sweetie. Have some coffee. I was able to bring in uh, definitely my own budding sexuality. <laughs> I, I think that uh, there, there's a, a sassiness about being that age that is kind of uh, fun and, and naughty. And so I think I'd, I was able to bring in a, some, you know, a little bit of back talk. Fuck off, Wade. That kind of young, you know, girl who's, you know, I'm taller than you are. <laughs> My boobs are bigger than your boobs. <laughs> you know, the guy's interested in me. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, you know, finding that, like, that power. Brady, are you coming in or what? Kathleen, I knew, I knew in high school, and she was, like, always the hottest girl. Everyone always, was always chasing her. And I never even was even on the radar, and so I thought, this is been great. And Ellie, I mean, I just loved Ellie. Ellie was a, the, she was like the hottie, she was the star. I remember Dwight had Sasha and I go off and practice, practice the kissing before the drugstore, which I just thought was hilarious. Um, he's a jokester. We really needed help getting into these scenes, so I kind of pushed that along, yeah. I think Brady was trying to feel his wings of a player. I don't think he was a player. I think he wanted to see if he had any game whatsoever. And I think that might have been his first foray into game. <laughs> he was having a blast. And it was fun because we were kind of playing him a little bit and he was playing us a little bit. And yeah, life imitated art a little bit, but it, it, was, it was all in, in good fun and, and nobody got their feelings hurt or tweaked or... It, but it was great. <laughs> it was like, oh, so you're hanging out with her at lunch today. All right, got it. Well, I'll just let you get back to Little Miss Hot Panties. When I think about how we did the love scene on the fire, in front of the fireplace, um, you know, they got me to go as far as they could to keep it PG. It was our first scene. We arrived that night, we did some rehearsing that night, and the next day we did that scene. Um, and I was really nervous about it. But then, an hour-ish and a half later, while the lights are there and the grips are there and the camera's there, I was like, can you just get off me now? <laughs> it, was like, it, was, it just turned into, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it was numbed out. But it was, it was exceptional, it was good. Cops do it by the book, but the sheriff's daughter, she does it by the fireplace. And I think the, uh, the shirt that cops do it by the book, I think that was designed by Bucky, the prop master. What are you, deaf? And the prop guy was, of course, in charge of putting together the helmets and all the, the uniforms that went with that. And I just think it was an inside joke. Bucky tried to get himself into everywhere that Bucky could get himself, including maybe some of the crew, but who knows? <laughs> He was a pretty funny guy. We were all really close because it's a pretty isolated um, circumstance to, you know, to be on a set that long together. At the time, I auditioned for a character named Kyle, which was the Frankenstein kid in the school when they're teasing Jamie about her mom being dead. Jamie's an orphan. I didn't get that. A couple days later, agent called me and said, "Hey, they liked you, but they don't want you to to play that character. They actually want you to play little Michael." And it was six, seven hours of literally, Eric, come stand in front of this mirror. There's three scenes that I'm in in Halloween 4. The first one was when they, they do the exterior and it says Halloween and it has the kids chasing after the school bus. Um, I'm the last kid in the, in the line of kids chasing after the bus. And then after that, they drove me down the street and put me in the clown costume and they took pictures of me um, in the clown costume and that's actually in the, the shoebox. You know. Uh, we went over to the events and shot the exterior of Vincent's, and I'm actually in that scene as well. But for the first 10, 15 years after I filmed that, I had no idea like how significant that was, other than I was in this movie for three seconds back in 1988. I worked at Don Post Studios, and we made the original mask for Halloween. 
and this producer, he brought a mask out for me and looked at it. It was pink with white hair. And I thought, that isn't quite the mask, but we'll work around it, you know. So I got hired. I asked Don Post Jr. Uh, when he redid it for us to use the Shatner mold and actually use William Shatner because we wanted the actual true face. I didn't get a chance to see those masks until we actually got on set. I opened the box and there were six of them and they were pink with white hair. And I was going, this is not right. It's supposed to be white with brown hair. <laughs> And I told the producer that it should be changed. I remember somebody saying at some point, Michael Myers doesn't have blonde hair. He's, it's, the mask is brown. And there was some kind of scrambling and shit going on. There was tremendous um, upheaval about it. You know, a lot of discussion, a lot of committee meetings about the mask, the mask, the mask. And I had to actually repaint the mask white and streak tip the white hair brown to reverse it to make it look like Michael Myers. And that's why it had that bumpy texture to it. There's always issues with the masks, always, and I think that's created a whole folklore to itself, you know, getting these masks and all the different looks. There's a scene in the school, you can see directly that it's a pink mask with white hair. I still believe that the reason that mask in the throwing uh, Loomis through the door in the elementary school is off is because someone ran to the prop truck at four in the morning and brought in the wrong mask and everybody was too overtired to catch it. I really think that was a, a mistake and uh, had we more time or money we probably should have gone back and reshot it. Help me. Help me. My communication regarding the activity of Michael Myers was always through Fred Lerner, the stunt coordinator. He was a member of the Stuntman Association and he had the show and he knew me and just asked me if I wanted to do it. You know I had one situation with our director, Dwight Little, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him, but during the first part when we were shooting in the gas station and I was supposed to stand behind the counter and Donald Pleasant shoots me, he put a rope around me with a, a, a jerk line so that when Donald actually shot me, they could, he could pull me right out of frame and then be a nice clean cut. God damn you. And when we did that, the director wanted me to take a reaction. And I thought it was kind of strange, but I did. Uh, next time we did the shot, uh, uh, second take, I took a shot, ran, fell against the counter, hit some plates and fell down. And I don't think that went over too well in dailies. I recall Tom Morga with that situation when he was replaced, and it was uh, early on in the shooting, as I recall. And I believe what it came down to was the way he was portraying the shape. There was a lot of disappointment and a lot of concern from Mustafa because they were they felt very proprietary about Michael, that it looked exactly right. Um, I had my eye kind of on the cast and the acting and the photography, so I wasn't watching it as carefully as they were. But I know there were conversations and there was a lot of redoing and readjusting. We had a problem with the mask, with the eyes being cut open. Uh, the producer came up and wanted the eyes bigger. And I said, there's no way I can cut these eyes open and change the, the filter within three minutes when we're filming because if we do, the glue would be fresh and Tom underneath it would actually faint and fall over and kill himself. So we had a big argument and he, the stuntman had an argument with the producer and finally we kind of won because we had no time to do the change. He decided to fire me and he did. He fired me uh, right in front of the crew. At the time, Fangora Magazine was doing a big article. The guy who was there knew me, and he told the producer that if he didn't hire me back, he would not do anything for him whatsoever to promote this movie. So they turned around within a half an hour, and they actually hired me back. I was in the makeup department getting ready to leave, and they knocked on the door and said, we're sorry, we want you to come back. We don't want you, we don't want you to leave. So I stayed with the company. Uh, unfortunately, the stuntman did get let go. I'm the one that got the credit. Tom got fired off the show. And far as why or how or why, I just, I don't even want to go there. But I replaced Tom on uh, the beginning of Halloween 4 for whatever reason. I'm often asked about how much of the film I did because I shared the film with, with uh, George Wilbur. First thing I did was at the gas station. I was in gauze. And then I got shot at by Donald Pleasance and, and I drove the tow truck 
broke the door on the garage and chased him down. And, and then I was in the drugstore, put the mask on in that scene. I was uh, shot in the face with a CO2 from a fire extinguisher. The last part I did on the film was at the uh, Sheriff Meeker's house. I had a double barrel shotgun and used it to impale her up on the door. And that's uh, basically about the last thing I did, at least in sequence in the film. They interviewed three or four stuntmen uh, to po possibly play the part as Michael Myers. They wanted somebody over six foot, that the last two or first two were kind of short guys. They wanted somebody at least six foot or bigger. And Mustafa Kad uh, chose me, picked me, said, I like this Mr. This, this George Wilbur guy here. They liked my walk. I got a, my own style, Wilbur walk. And Mustafa said, that's a good walk. That's, the way I, that's what I am. That's who I, who I am is this, this walk, you know. All of the guys that I've ever worked with that are these like big bad killers are the nicest, sweetest, most loving men. And maybe this is like their, the flip side of their alter ego. Or maybe I don't know that side of them. I handled her like my own daughter. I didn't want to scare her. I didn't want to take her acting ability away. But no, I said, Danielle, remember, this is make believe. And I'm George. We're going to have fun doing the scene when I grab you from under the bed. Remember, it's only me. I remember a lot of times, like him taking the mask, you know, him not having the mask on until he had to have it on. So we kind of would walk through things. Got you rope my daughter. I used that shotgun on you. You understand? Honestly, my favorite uh, actor in, uh, in the movie was a Bo Star. I thought, you know, he really nailed the part of the sheriff. He was just, he just hit it out of the park. He was exactly what I wrote. Son of a bitch, you just created a lynch mob. You haven't got a police force. Well, I play a lot of police. Um, and it was a basic uh, sheriff of the town, and he was, uh, he was the guy appointed to uh, get the villain. <laughs> and help uh, Dr. Loomis. I tell you, Michael Myers is here in this town. He's here to kill that little girl and anybody who gets in his way. Donald Pleasance was one of the finest actors around at the time, and he just lent uh, a certain amount of, of uh, stature to the, the entire production. Well, the fact that he had agreed to do Halloween 4 was probably the biggest and strongest incentive for me to want to fight to get this movie. I mean, to work as a young filmmaker, to work with a, a, an English actor of that caliber with that credit history, it was a huge incentive for me, and I enjoyed every minute of it. You know, he was the movie star. Like, he was the movie star on set, so shit went right when Donald walked on set, that's for sure. But he was still very um, cordial and um, super, super sweet with Danielle and I. Way out of my league when I got to the set. I, I was just a 19-year-old kid and, and really had no real concept of all the work that he had already done. But he was a, a very sweet, genuine, kind-hearted. You know, he would just go in and nail it on the first take. He was he was a seasoned pro, and it was a real honor to work with him. Michael Myers is in hell, buried where he belongs. He was an older man at that time, and he tired easily. And of course, because it's Halloween, we had a lot of night shooting. And one of my responsibilities was to make sure that we worked him for four or five hours to get the best from him and that the rest of the, the day would be very um, light driving or, or walking up to the house or something that didn't require a lot of mental activity. Um, not to say that he wasn't willing in game, it's just I did notice he would, after four or five hours of straight shooting and dialogue scenes, he would, he would tire. And I didn't want to lose his energy and I didn't want to lose his enthusiasm. So. We boarded him very carefully, so he was fresh, got his work done, and then we moved on to do other things. But other than that, he was very game to do anything you asked. Look at me, Hoffman. Take a good look. They wanted him burnt. So we had to burn his right hand and right cheek. And we did a test makeup on it, and we did like basically, a, it looked like a hollow circle with a, a boil in the middle. And that was, okayed by everybody before we started shooting the movie. Burn makeup is very difficult. And what we realized is we just needed enough to remind the audience that we knew about the fire and the explosion. But by overdoing it, it became distracting. 
to the story. Donald was watching the, the um, dailies with his girlfriend and they were a little tipsy. And his girlfriend freaked out and said, look, Donald, you got an egg on the side of your face. And he went, he freaked out. And he goes, oh my God, it does look like an egg. And if you really look at it, it does kind of look like a fried egg on the side of his face. And uh, the next day, the director came over in the makeup department with me, knocked on the door and said, Donald's coming in. He wants a new scar on the side of his face. And we really had to work to sort of find a medium. Um, and it was frustrating because, you know, you want to come out of the gate and get everything right, but it took a little work. Every scene that we had with that scar, we had to reshoot it. Uh, unfortunately, in the editing, somehow they mixed it up and you will see at the beginning when he's with the preacher in the truck, it goes back and forth, back and forth. It didn't really make me look very good. <laughs> Matter of fact, the Halloween 4 was my last movie. I retired after that. Halloween 4 was about the fourth film I worked on, but it was the first Halloween. I was right out of high school and I was a PA. My activities ranged from getting the actors drinks to raking up the leaves. If you see all those leaves all throughout the film, uh, you can just picture me on a cold Utah morning raking all those up on the set. But it was a great experience. It was a really well-oiled machine and uh, it was a really smooth production. They pretty much shot what I wrote. You know, they, there were some changes for budget, but the script I wrote is pretty much the script that they shot, which uh, kind of set me up in a wrong way for Hollywood because I thought, oh great, you shoot it, you write a script, they shoot what you write, this is fantastic. You know, that has never happened since. I mean, Halloween 4 stands alone as kind of the, the best experience I've had in, in uh, feature films because I, you know, what I wrote actually made it to the screen. Mustafa was there to give his opinions and advice, but he mostly let, let me alone in the field. He was lovely, he was really quiet, very elegant, um, always kind very respectful. And Mustafa was very supportive of the script. He really loved the script. That's what was great is that, you know, when he read it, he always, he raved about it. In fact, there's a scene in H2O where there's a chase inside of a, a, a school where the main character's hiding under desks. That was, a, that was a scene out of Halloween 4 that we didn't have time to shoot. And here he did, you know, here it was then implanted in the, into H2O. So to me, uh, that was a great compliment from Mustafa. My father and Dwight had a really good, tight relationship. I think um, my father respected and trusted Dwight a lot, uh, let him do his thing, whereas I think on Dwight's hand, he also had that respect for my father as a director. We didn't really feel like we were doing anything special, but we were all big horror fans. And the one thing that kind of really got us was it was very, very atmospheric. Dwight really leaned heavily on atmosphere, and that kind of got us into it. And I had to be crying in the closet, but you know, holding the box with Jamie Lee stuff in it. I couldn't really get there, so Dwight actually like brought me into the closet, and was like talking to me really stern about what was really going on, and then closed the door and put the light out in the closet, and I just got hysterical because I was completely freaked out about the fact that I was locked in the dark. Oh, dear God. You know, when, when you have a director that's just so, kind of sets the tone, I think everybody else really takes the initiative and, you know, there, there wasn't anybody that had an ego or, or a tantrum or anything. Everyone was just really happy to be there. I didn't have a single disappointment with the cast. They were all exactly right for their parts. I think, honestly, one of the things that people respond to in this movie is the quality of the casting. I mean, from Bo Starr to Kathleen and Sasha and Ellie and Danielle and... I mean, it, it's a really cohesive cast and it came together um, uh, in a, an or organic way and I think it makes the movie, honestly. My death scene was uh, the most challenging part about it was being rigged in the harness. Um, there wasn't any blood. Uh, there never was. It was uh, mostly 
engineered to just have the shock value of being riot gunned through the torso and lifted and then shoved into the door. So what they did is they, they put a harness on me, they, they drilled a hole into the, the door and they stuck a little 10 speed bicycle seat on that, which is pretty uncomfortable no matter what anyway. So they got me up on that so that my legs would be dangling and then they put a, a rigging on and then they pulled me back from the back through a little hole in the wall. So there was a wire and it was kind of cutting in. And so I did that a few times and then they took me off and then my kidneys filled up pretty quickly, which was a shock. So that's what's fun as an actor is that you get to go and play that. You get to go and go to that place of absolute terror and seeing your life flash before your eyes and, and being so frightened, but then knowing that you can come out of it you know, and then it's like, ah, oh, la da da, that's a wrap. <laughs> you know? Ready? Get up there, Rachel! The death of my character, it was really kind of a tribute to the old style Western fight. You know, it was kind of like you do a cross, you know, and you, you kind of miss and, and go, go at it again and go at it again and do it with the gun, and then he gets it. <laughs> that fight goes back 50 years, and what they did is they put me on a teeter totter. And so they put the teeter-totter under my butt, and I'm sitting on it, and it's off camera, and the second he lifts me up, they, they lifted me up, and then he twisted my face and my, and my head, and then I spit the blood. It was a, a, a blood capsule, and they put it in my mouth, and I, and I didn't know when, when I was supposed to do it, and I thought they were gonna cut, because all of a sudden I started gagging on it, and I pff, spit it to the side, and I thought it was, okay, we're, not, we're gonna have to do this again, because this, they were going to cut, but they kept it. The final fight on the rooftop um, was a complicated stunt action camera sequence. In the original script, Sheriff Ben Meeker actually fought with Michael in the basement of the house. And the fight uh, between the two of them, that's when you know, Ben Meeker dies fighting the shape. Uh, the furnace uh, uh, gets knocked over, a fire starts in the basement, and so then the house becomes engulfed in flames, and this is actually what drives Rachel and Jamie toward the roof. And so you end up with this great sequence where the house is in flames, they're on the roof, the shape is on the roof with them. You know, they're, you know how are they gonna survive that? And then that leads to making their way off the roof. But I always wanted that great visual of the flames and the smoke and the house being consumed beneath their feet. That, I think that would have been amazing. Of course, that would have been a, you know, probably another you know, $3 million to do something like that. We considered it on a practical roof. We scouted actual roofs. We thought about how we could do it. We thought about doing it green screen on a stage where we would just be able to have harnesses and have everything under control. But then we thought that might look fake. And if there was one moment in this movie that looked like a green screen or looked phony, then we knew we would throw the audience out of the movie. So the solution that we came up with with the production designer was to build the entire roof of a house with the gutters about six feet off the ground, which we built in an open field. And it never had that green screen kind of fake feeling because it wasn't, it was all authentic, it was just built. It was still high enough to be of some danger to the actors, but we had uh, people stationed around that could catch anybody if they did slip. I did all of the roof stuff except the drop. Um, so I was getting harnessed in and, you know, go, getting turned over. And then I hung there when it was still. It was precarious at times, but we worked with Danielle. That was the main thing, make sure she felt safe and comfortable. Well, she did. She's a trooper. She did very well. It was freezing at night. I mean, it would like, there would be like a dew over the slate on the roof and then it would ice over. So it kept freezing and Ellie kept slipping. So all of that stuff is, is really real. We had stuntmen all around the bottom, so if anybody fell or slipped, they would fall into you know catch pads or into stunt people. It also gave me the freedom to actually shoot without wires. We were pretty close to being finished, and it was in one of the sequences where I slide down with Danielle on my back. They made the roof so fast that at the bottom of it, this, a little staple gun was sticking out, the staple. And when they slid her down the roof, that's when it caught her stomach and it cut it right open all the way down. You know, I didn't bleed out. There were no intestines showing. I mean, it was not that, you know, it was just a surface wound. But I think the set medic went bonkers just because we had more to shoot.
So they patched me up and we went back to work. Literally the whole sequence in the pickup truck was, you know, there were two by fours underneath the truck and prop guys ju jumping on the, on the boards to make us look like we were rolling along. So, I mean, it was really effective how it all came together um, really seamlessly because I was there and a lot of that was added after the fact. The guys fighting on the truck and climbing up on the truck and throwing them off and all that. It was, it was again, our stunt corps, the Fred Lerner did a good job. We worked it all out. We had professional stunt guys, so we all worked good together as stunt guys. So much of that was movie magic. And, you know, once all the elements come together and you see it up on screen, it was, it was really cool. You know, killing Michael Myers, that was great. We must have shot him a thousand times. I never expected that to be coming back. You know, one thing that Al and I were very committed to was this execution of Michael Myers by the police, putting him into his early grave. We actually threw dynamite into the, into the well at the end of Halloween 4. We cut that, but then they used, it, they used that, that sequence in Halloween 5, so that was kind of interesting. The transfer from Michael to Jamie through the hand was very carefully thought out and that she was going to then, the twist ending was going to be she had been in a sense possessed by Michael's spirit through the bloodline and would come back at the very, at the epilogue of the movie. And to have that shock moment of him turning that corner and seeing her at the top of the stairs standing there with the, you know, with the scissors. No! No! This harkens right back to the first film, right back to Michael standing outside I wanted that exact tie-in, so it's like, it's starting, it's starting again, it's starting again. It was, as we all know, something that people have talked about. It was kind of one of the highlights of the movie. My double actually did the stabbing. They didn't want me to do it, which is interesting, considering that the whole movie I'm being chased by somebody with a large knife trying to kill me. That's why the twist at the end is so overwhelming is because you just don't expect this girl to be possessed by Michael's devil spirit, and it's why it's so shocking. And that, that famous, you know, no, no of Loomis coming around, this, I still get the chills thinking about it, so it's a pretty rad ending of the movie. When I saw Halloween 5, I was very disappointed they didn't go in the direction that uh, I'd hoped they would with the legacy and with Jamie and building on that. You know, there was so much potential in the series to go in a very strong and new direction, but Sadly, uh, you know, they, they went in the direction they did. It was never intended to have her take over the franchise in that way. So how it was going to be resolved in five was not entirely clear at the moment, but uh, it definitely was not for her to become the focus of the films. We screened the movie um, and had a very successful screening when we cut it all together and we had a temp mix and we had, you know, temp effects in there and we screened it. We had several screenings, but one of them was at Sony downstairs and all the cards that we got and some of the reactions we got were that people loved the movie, but it just wasn't quite edgy enough and they didn't feel like Michael really delivered on his ability to, to create carnage and wreckage. Maybe it was because it was a different time and they wanted it to be, I don't know, bloodier, badder, cooler, but it didn't really seem to fit. There really wasn't a lot of blood in Halloween 4. I think that that was a specific choice from the very beginning. I think what they wanted to do was really create the suspense and the fear of what suspense does. And I think Mustafa felt like the audience was a little bit unfulfilled in that sense. And so he came to me and said, I need to sort of edge up this movie. Where can we do it? Where can we make it organic to the movie? The, the additional photography was all shot in Los Angeles. Uh, it was unnecessary to go back to Salt Lake City you know, for those situations that were predominantly inserts. The worst problem I had with Mustafa was he hated blood. And I would say to him, you know, it's pretty hard to do a horror film without seeing some blood. And when he'd see blood on a, a knife, he would go dizzy. I had a brief meeting with Mustafa, who, uh, you know, said, 
absolutely I don't want much blood in this. I, I really want almost no blood. I want it to remain uh, in, in spirit, very close to the, uh, the uh, original Halloween film, which had no blood in it, and we just want to maintain that. But we need some more visceral impact. So fine. The first thing was when Michael wakes up. It was an aftermath initially where you just saw a bloody interior and you sort of like, well, what happened? So we thought it might be kind of fun for Michael to wake up and kill the people inside. No, I still don't understand. <laughs> the now famous thumb in the forehead sequence, which was shocking and it was very effective. It was also the most economic special effect in the history of the world. We cut back to what is actually a mechanical hand with a retractable thumb. So it went right into his uh, forehead and it worked very effectively. Nobody was expecting it. I think that was the kill that basically made everybody jump and say, yeah, okay, I like, yeah, okay, I know what kind of movie this is gonna be now. The second one that we did was uh, Michael's hand in the neck of the driver of the pickup truck. Uh, and the, the, the one thing that is remembered is Mustafa, who did, wanted absolutely no blood, was the guy screaming on the set, more blood, more blood, more blood. So that was, that was fun. And we cut them in and they didn't feel um, sort of like overdone or it didn't feel inorganic. They felt like they were part of the same movie. I was happy about that. We had actually created another effect that they didn't ultimately use at the mechanics. Initially, he was going to pick up a, a crowbar and shove it down a guy's throat. Uh, I, I think uh, it was deemed a little bit, nah, it's a little strange. Let's, let's not do that. So that, that did not happen. So I think that it was an elegant solution to sort of have the death off screen so that you wouldn't necessarily see uh, what happened. So I, I don't know. I kind of like enigmas in horror movies anyway. Alan. Howarth, the composer, was all of our choices to come in and create that continuity um, with Halloween 1, with all the way through to Halloween 4. I don't think there was ever really any other discussion that I was aware of that, that other than that he would do the music. I was certainly happy with the decision. I know that Mustafa wanted him back. Um, we were all excited to have him do it. So there was never, I don't think there was any, ever any doubt that he would be our guy. They called me up, I said, hey, would you be willing to do the music for Halloween 4? And because John and I were buddies, I kind of really turned to John and says, hey, they called, asked one to do Halloween 4, is that okay by you? I mean, I wanted to make sure I wasn't crossing lines here. And he goes, do whatever you want, you know, just do your thing. So, so hence I launch on Halloween 4. Now, so for my own impressions now, obviously I've, I've inherited all the Halloween music, but I want to put a little more Alan Howard stamp on what it sounds like, etc. So if you go, let's say, the opening scene of Halloween 4, rather than jumping right into the Halloween theme, I made a whole atmospheric, kind of <sighs> scary thing. We're going across the, the wind blowing, the scarecrows setting the scene, and I really held back on playing that Halloween theme until finally Michael's up. So the arc of Halloween 4 is really Alan Howarth finally does Halloween in his style. And uh, so, so that, that's where we started. I was driving to Westwood, California the night that it premiered, and I saw a huge line of people down the sidewalk, which I assumed was for the Jodie Foster movie or was whatever the big Hollow Studio movie was. As we were driving around the corner, we started to realize that the line that we were seeing was for our movie, for Halloween 4, and we were shocked. We were completely shocked. And I remember sitting in the audience and just listening to the, the gasps and, the, and the, you know, the reactions. There's nothing like that you know, for a writer, is to hear and see the audience reacting to your words and reacting to what they're seeing on screen. Then you know you've done your job, and I felt like we, we did a really good job. It was such a big deal. I mean, I just, I was in, I was like, oh my God, this is, I mean, it's, it's huge. It was something that I think fans, now as an adult, I, I understand what it was. They had been missing Michael. It was a number one on the box office charts for two weeks in a row, which was kind of unprecedented for that kind of movie. The response was, at least commercially, it was fantastic. 
Critically, it was all over the map. It was um, four stars, one star. Loved it, hated it. They, they ruined it. They, they brought it back. They're heroes, they're villains. You know, it was like whatever you wanted to read about this movie, you know, you could. No, I think it was the best of all the Halloween movies except for the first one. Dwight Little did a great job on that. We were lucky. We were all young kids and we got uh, a great script and a great franchise and people that were really giving 100% to everything behind the scenes and, and making it the classic that it is. It's a film that will stand the test of time and I'm proud to be an actor who has been in something like that. It did well. It did very well, and uh, I think that's why they, you know, jumped right on Halloween 5. Mustafa came to us, and came to Dwight and I, and said, would we be willing to do Halloween 5? And, you know, at the time, we were moving on to do, there was an action movie that I'd written, and Dwight and I were trying to get that off the ground. So we said, you know, we weren't available to do it, and, you know, moved on, but we thought we'd set it up in a way that they'd carry, carry it on. But it was going to be impossible to do it better. And I think my feeling was, you know what, I, I, I tried as hard as I could, I took my best shot, people seemed to like it, and I should just, you know, let that, let that go. So I always said no to him, I was always flattered to be asked, and I just felt like we just got it right, and, and let's leave it alone. And now, looking back, I really wish we had stayed with it, because it would have been nice to follow that line the way I'd originally envisioned. I mean, no matter what movie I do, it's still going to be You're the Girl from Halloween. And they're not talking about Halloween 5. I'm like Jamie in the clown costume at the top of the stairs with the scissors. That's, that's really, you know, who I am. It's, it's a classic movie. People tend to like 4 and the first one. And I kind of agree with that.